All right. So yes, I was going to say, are you familiar with this? Who knows what this logo is? Right. Well, oh, wow. OK, amazing. All of you do. Uh, well, it's a hard bleed bug, right? Um, and the reason um, I'm starting my talk about it is the heart bleed bug has, well, first of all, it, it's a bug that had a huge impact, right? And one of the examples is uh, 4.5 million uh, medical rep uh, uh, records were actually lost their confidentiality, right? And the other uh, big number attached to that bug um, is the actual estimated cost to the industry, which is $500 million, which is a sizable amount of money. I'm going to be talking quite a bit about money in this talk because even though I know this is something as a community we don't really like to talk about that much, when we talk about sustainability and open source, you kind of have to talk about money. So uh, it was a huge bug that had a big impact. Um, and what it really did is it was at least, a, I, I see it as a pivotal moment in how uh, open source was perceived uh, by the tech industry. And that for three reasons. Uh, the first one is it really showed that open source is everywhere, right? Uh, the OpenSSL library that had uh, that bug uh, was, uh, well, you know, is in uh, roughly two-thirds of active uh, sites on the internet, right? Um, the other aspect is it was a, open source is in at critical areas. This is a crypto library, right? It's not some fancy UI or something like this. It's something that... Uh, is, is, is critical to how the internet works. And then the last part, and the one that was probably the most um, sort of surprising to everyone was, well, what caused that bug? And one of the biggest reasons for that bug is how underfund, underfunded, sorry, the whole open source uh, ecosystem is. Um, and we learned that basically OpenSSL was one person full time plus a roughly $2,000 per year budget, right? Um, and so this would have triggered um, a, a pretty large conversation in the community about sustainability. Um, and we started hearing uh, stories of uh, maintainer breakdown, uh, burnout, uh, maintainers being tired of uh, working on open source projects. Um, and that's also at the same time that we started to really look for solutions for that. And so one of the first things that um, main, uh, software open source maintainers looked for is how they could actually use existing solutions that were designed at other, um, uh, for, other for other things than, op than software open source itself and use it to sort of make their open source practice more sustainable. Um, so one of the first um, app, well, system that was used uh, was uh, Patreon. Patreon, who was originally designed um, for artists to try to create a meaningful revenue stream for artist work. And one software developer, and in, in, uh, open source developer in particular, Avenue, uh, the creator of Vue.js, uh, was able to really uh, organize uh, um, himself uh, um, a solution where um, people who were using uh, Vue.js were uh, really interested to fund his work on it. And that led to him um, being able to, to net roughly $17,000 monthly to work on the project full time. Right? So that's a really nice success story for sort of like an open source maintainer, thank you, working on, on um, uh, full time on open source. Uh, but, you know, the kick is, is it really reproducible? And the answer to that is not really, right? This is sort of like a one-off success story, and it's not really a um, common solution to the problem of open source sustainability. Um, so we've seen a, a lot of uh, other things. One of the interesting um, so, uh, solution that is um, right now for this problem is Gitcoin. Um, and Gitcoin is interesting because it's actually a whole ecosystem of tools designed to help uh, open source uh, maintainers make um, money or make a living out of uh, their work. It's com it's, there's um, two or three different products, one of which is actually also called Gitcoin. So, so that makes it a bit confusing. It's both, the product, both one product and the company itself. 
And what Gitcoin is, is basically a GitHub issue market. So if you have um, a software bug uh, that you want someone to work on, on an open source project, you attach a bounty to an issue, um, and then open source developers can come and contribute to that issue, send a pull, uh, pull request, and once that pull request is merged, they actually get uh, paid in Ether coins because a blockchain, right? Uh, and so um, that um, Gitcoin in 2018 uh, gave away about a half a million dollars of uh, bounties. Um, and so another part of that uh, Gitcoin ecosystem is CodeFund, uh, which is uh, an ad network that is um, so-called ethical. The ads are contextual, they're not based on tracking uh, users. Um, and they're focused on uh, displaying ads on websites of open source projects. And of course, one of the big value is for uh, hiring purposes, right? If you're looking for a developer, uh, it's a, open source project is a great place to uh, put an ad about the open positions at your company. Um, so that has been making roughly $10,000 uh, dollars in monthly revenue and redistributing 6,000 uh, of those uh, to uh, the community of maintainers of open source projects. Of course, uh, when you talk about um, software, there's always uh, the VC route, right? Um, and I know this community is not a community that particularly is inclined to uh, go the VC route, but nonetheless, with all of the acquisitions and sort of like excitement around the Red Hat acquisition, around lots of IPOs for uh, large um, sort of open source based companies. Um, uh, it's still something that's uh, a solution and there's even uh, now a sort of dedicated fund in the making called OSS Capital, uh, which is uh, basically trying to fund open source uh, projects to turn them into a large business with uh, valuable uh, exits for uh, the VCs. Another exciting solution is Open Collective. So Open Collective was started as a, um, it's, it's a way to help communities uh, um, self-organize and fund themselves. And it sort of came around roughly at the same time as the uh, all of this questioning in the open source world around uh, sustainability. And so it has uh, really surfed that, that uh, wave um, and um, has been really um, uh, helpful around the open source community. What it does basically is it provides a um, infrastructure, legal uh, and accounting infrastructure for open source projects to be able to accept funds uh, and redistribute them to the developers uh, or the, the people actually working on the project. Uh, Open Collective has one really big success story, which is Webpack, uh, which in 2017 made $250,000 off of the platform um, and has made $400,000 uh, in yearly funding last year. And what's really interesting, it's a win-win uh, story because its biggest contributor, which is uh, uh, Trivago, the hotel uh, booking uh, European website um, has gotten a lot out of it in terms of visibility and it has helped them hire uh, really good uh, top engineers. So it, it's, an, it's an interesting model where uh, developers actually get funded and are able to work full time on a, on a project and the, the companies funding them actually really getting something out of it. And actually uh, Trivago was also really happy about the work, the technical source code work that was done which really helped some of the work that we're doing. The problem Open Collective has, however, is a, a long tail problem, which is that pretty much all of the money goes to like a few projects, and then after that, it's uh, very little to a lot of projects. Um, late last year, um, Open Collective uh, added uh, back your stack to its offering. So back your stack um, is just a little piece of software that goes on GitHub, looks at uh, your organization on GitHub, looks at all of the packages that you have and, and builds a dependency tree 
of all of the software you're using as an organization, all of the open source software you're using as an organization, and then um, lets you, um, well, compares that with the ones that are on Open Collective, and then basically lets you either choose to fund some of those or give a lump amount that is redistributed to all of the projects you rely on. And that's a similar um, solution to the one that Tidelift um, has created. But Tidelift um, has sort of like a red hat business model, but for the long tail of open source projects. So basically what it does is um, it, you know, on, on using the same sort of like software that uh, Back Your Stack does, uh, what it does is it looks at all of the open source software you're, you're relying on and then offers uh, security updates, maintenance, and, and uh, guarantees basically uh, around the open source software that you use for a fee. And it then uses that fee to pay the actual maintainers working on those projects to keep them updated and secure. Right? So that's the idea. It's a similar business model than Red Hat except for like a much larger, uh, well, for much smaller projects. Um, and well, it's really brand new, and so we don't really have uh, a good idea of how effective and how impactful it's going to be in the ecosystem. Um, so we talked about um, a number of different solutions that have emerged over the last couple of, well, three or four years around um, making open source projects more sustainable. Um, and what I want to do quickly now is look at sort of the issues that uh, we have with these three projects and the, with these, well, four or five projects I talked about and, and then sort of like propose a, a larger solution to that problem. And so those three issues are, the first one is one of scale, right? So I'll go into that shortly. Um, the second one is one of misaligned incentives between open source projects that are becoming professional projects and developers relying on those projects. And then the third one is just a question of uh, whether it's a good idea to actually limit sort of open source practice to a few subset of developers and not bring it to uh, developers at large. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, this really nice small video s sequence that explained the, the American debt uh, a couple of years ago. It was a YouTube video um, made by, uh, well, we can't really see it here, but it's made by a website called uh, demonocracy.info. And they were really kind to let me use those graphics to sort of uh, make the point about scale. Uh, so that is a $100 uh, bill, right? If you stack... Uh, uh, 100 of those, you have $10,000, and that is uh, the monthly revenue of Code Fund, the ad network we were talking about before. Um, now if you stack together 100 of those uh, uh, bills, you get $1 million. Um, and that is the amount of money that, op that Open Collective has redistributed over a year. And it's the same amount also that Tidelift has committed to pay developers. So that sounds like a sizable amount of money. Um, but let's compare that uh, to the worldwide developer population, which is estimated to be roughly around a, a bit above 22 million developers in the world. Um, half, a bit more than half of them are full time. Then you have sort of like a third-ish that are part-time, and non-professionals are sort of, sort of like the rest. So if you do some quick back-of-the-envelope math, uh, you're going to see really quickly that the numbers are astounding. So if you account for 12 million uh, full-time developers, and you take an average uh, pay of $65,000 per year, uh, we can sort of discuss whether that's a, a bit too high or a bit too low, but it it actually gets me to a nice round number at the end. So <laughs> please bear with me, okay? Um, so that gives us $780 billion spent in wages for full-time developers in the world per year, right? If you add to that um, 6 million part-time developers at 35K a year, right? 
um, and you add that, it gives you a total of $1 trillion per year in developer wages, right? So let's have a look at what that means in comparison to the kind of money that these solutions are providing right now. So if we stack 100 of those million dollars onto a pallet, right, we get $100 million, okay? So to get to a billion, we need 10 of those pallets, all right? And if we make a square of 10 by 10 of those pallets, now we get $10 billion worth of bills, all right? And so to get to a trillion dollar, well, we have to stack a lot of those, right? A hundred of them, okay? So if you compare with the little person that's, you know, over there, down here, right? Um, and the, the one million dollar amount that Open, Collect Open Collective is collecting, and you compare that to the sheer size of developers, in, in the world and, and how much money are actually uh, paid to developers, it is a really, 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 really tiny amount. So the second thing uh, that to me is a bit of a problem was the, open, um, the, the solutions that we've been looking at and focused on to solve open source sustainability um, is uh, what um, DHH calls, well, refers to as misaligned, uh, misaligned incentives. Um, and he talks uh, quite a bit of that, about that in a blog post of his called uh, The Perils of Mixing Open Source and Money. It's an old post, but I think it's sort of like the crux of the post is really interesting, which is to say that one of the key values of, of open source is it's actually built by people who are trying to scratch an itch, right? solve a problem that they have in the particular context that they're in, and then once that problem is solved, move back on to the core of their business. And if we really start um, separating um, this and have on one side developers that are open source developers focused on creating open source code, and on the other side developers which are consumers of that open source code, and we sort of we s s lose sort of this value. Um, and it's interesting to see that if you look at um, developers working on the Linux kernel, you actually see that uh, 97, sorry, 93% of them, 92% of them, are actually working on the kernel as part of their job. Um, and so we tend to look at the focus on finding solutions for the 7.7% that are up there. And I agree that the Linux kernel is probably like a bit special. Uh, but it's to say that, like, we're really looking at both from a sort of money perspective and from an actual uh, uh, real-life perspective, we're too focused on this um, small area up there and not on the big picture. Um, and the last, you know, the last point is um, open source is actually really, really cool. Uh, I, I mean, I guess this is the case for pretty much everyone that's in this room, but I owe my whole career uh, to my involvement with open source. Um, I've met, like, a lot of my friends in that, in that place. I've learned pretty much everything from working in the open source world. And I don't, I, I, I sort of, like, I find it, I would find it really sad if we suddenly decided that this was only something that a really small percentages of open source developers would have access to and not developers at large. Um, so with that said, well, we need to find a solution to, a, a more general solution to make um, open source accessible to more, uh, thank you, to more developers than just the ones that are focused on open source. Um, and for that, we need to better understand what the true value of open source is. I'm sure you've all seen this diagram at some point, right? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's this classical um, uh, flow diagram where you have uh, problems and coffee coming in, right? Um, An engineer is sort of like handling that and uh, has as output um, a solution, hopefully. Um, and also as a byproduct sarcasm. So what happens when we are more specific and turn that for a software engineer? Well, nothing changes, nothing much changes except the solution is uh, encoded in code, 
Like, that's what the output is. Um, so let's look at what happens when we have a software engineer working on open source code. Well, what happens is the output um, is open source code that suddenly goes into this you know, large pool of commons. Um, and in this large pool of commons, we have other engineers working um, and also outputting uh, open source code, right? And they usually come with a different coffee pot um, and a different set of problems. And as they start working together, uh, there are all of these uh, new things that happen. You have conversations between companies that otherwise wouldn't have talked together. Uh, you have mentoring that happened of uh, younger uh, developers by um, more senior ones. Um, you have networking that happens at events like this one and, and, and other events in the industry. Um, and all of this, um, actually, if you remember the sarcasm byproduct I mentioned before, all of this actually creates a whole bunch of byproducts, right? All of, all of these interactions and all of these um, uh, conversations. Um, and there are actually plenty of these. Um, and they touch a number of different aspects of software development. Um, and you can actually regroup them in sort of like four large categories, which are byproducts that um, impact the project itself that you're working on. Uh, you know, a classical one is you get better documentation, uh, you improve code quality by working in the open with um, more people on the project. Um, then you have a number of um, byproducts, some people call those like second order consequences, um, that actually impact individuals, right? Uh, working on open source, I mean, we all know that, like it, it levels you up, it uh, helps you with your soft skills. Uh, and it has a, a whole bunch of uh, really interesting impact at the individual level. And it has uh, also lots of impact at the team level um, uh, by inc increasing uh, efficiencies, for example, or also a, a concept I really like that we can't talk about today because we don't have the time, which is called a knowledge spillover. And finally, it has really positive impact, as I talked about with the Trivago example before, for the companies themselves who have engineers working in open source. And I just quickly want to give you two examples of that. The first one um, is a, a recent research by uh, Professor Frank Nagel uh, from the Harvard Business School uh, that um, has shown working, uh, that teams working in the Linux kernel that actually contributing back to the project are twice as effective on their own work than teams that are just freeloading, right? So that's not like 20% more effective, right? It's actually, uh, you know, and, and the, the research is actually really interesting to read and it's, it's, it's really deep work and it accounts for a whole lot of variables that it corrects, uh, but it's really making teams a lot more um, productive. Um, and then, uh, well, I'm well aware that Facebook is in the news uh, a lot these days for pretty bad things, but outside of that, um, when it really made a push uh, to drive open source, what created uh, software projects like uh, React, um, it actually uh, started um, having, uh, asking questions to new recruits as to what had uh, made them sign up uh, for the job. And 75% of new recruits at Facebook um, actually said that Facebook's open source program was one of the key reasons why they had taken the job. Um, so all that to say, that when we look at open source, we often look at the actual code itself as the value, right? But it turns out that there's a huge amount of value in the process itself, um, and that we've been really bad as a community to A, realize that, and B, uh, figure out how to capture that value. To me, the um, solution to open source sustainability is helping companies understand that value um, and actually help them leverage it, right? So show them, show the companies what's in it for them when they have engineers contributing. And that's it, folks. Thank you.
So we have time for a few questions. We welcome questions. Up there, yes? Oh, yep. Oh, I, I deliver. I like your beat. Sustainability, right? Right. Oh, look what you did there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. This is all good and great for companies which can afford to give um, and have part of open source as part of their um, workflow that are large enough. But what about, like in my community, most of the ecosystem is actually made up of very small companies, as in one man, two man people um, companies. Like, how can they also give back to open source? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, Yeah, I, 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 do. I don't have a good answer to that like that, frankly. I do. You do, wonderful. Sponsor meetups. It's inexpensive compared to most other forms of sponsorship, and it still gives value to the community by helping to bring together developers and supporting their uh, in-person engagement. So if you are a small shop but you still want to give back to open source, buying something delicious for your local meetup group can be a great way to give back. And if you're on a budget, you go to the local supermarket and buy lots of snacks. It works. I'm just saying. Other questions? No, lovely. Human at the front. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I really like the illustration that you made with the stack of bills uh, comparing the open source community versus um, uh, the, the rest of the industry. Uh, but I believe the small stack was mostly the examples that you listed, right? The yeah, mostly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah that's, that's correct. I mean, for, for example, the small stack, the $1 million was the amount of money that mm. Open Collective is redistributing. Um, so, but then you mentioned uh, Facebook open source program. I know Google has some. Absolutely. Um, a lot of companies have that Absolutely. already. Do, do you have the numbers for what already exists for, from the companies to, you know, have that, an that's, a, that's, a, that. that's a great question. Uh, I don't have the numbers, uh, and they would be really interesting to get. So basically, I, I think the question is, uh, sorry, because I sort of interrupted the, the last bit of your question. Uh, but I feel like the question is, how much are companies actually contributing in uh, human resources, basically? I, I don't have an answer to that. I think it's a good question. Um, and I, I think that um, this is what we should tend uh, towards, right? is get more companies contributing on the scale of these large uh, tech companies. I don't have an answer to what number that actually is. No, but I, I think it's, um, sorry, I'm interjecting because I used to work for a big company that had an open source program with office and it was one of the ones you mentioned. Um, I think it is a reasonable thing for us to talk to our friends who are at big company open source programs offices and ask them to publish data on that. That's a good point. Um, because a lot of them are getting uh, great recruitment value out of saying we have great support for open source software. So if they're actually able to publish metrics against what those contributions are, that's going to look better to would-be employees. I will talk to former coworkers. Wonderful. I'm not trying to bogart your community. No, no, that's great. Sorry. That's, 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 that's better, actually. We have a... Uh, nice human. One minute. La one, last question, I imagine. Hello. First of all, nice talk, nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I work at a rather small company. We've got six developers, no thing like quality assurance. Uh, assurance? Insurance? Whatever, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, do you think that for such a small company, uh, investing into open source makes sense? So that's, uh, well, it's, you know, it's a similar question as the one uh, we had first. Um, I, I think it does, but I think it actually needs uh, a real strategy behind it. Uh, I've seen... Um, a, a number of uh, small companies um, actually use their open source practice as a way to get clients. So it sort of depends what kind of company you are. If you're uh, m m uh, building software for others or if you're building software yourself. Uh, I, I think, I mean, there's a whole life cycle of where it, when it makes sense for a company to invest in open source. Um, and usually, small, small like early stage startups are not usually a good, um, uh, in a good position to do that. It just doesn't really make sense. 
But if you're um, um, uh, building software for other companies, it could be a strategic advantage um, to show that you're uh, building open source. It could help on a marketing uh, way. Or it could also help you uh, design solutions that can fit multiple of your clients uh, and open source those solutions and then uh, actually be able to make larger margins uh, by reselling the, that same solution to different companies. So there's lots of tactic. It's really like tactical sort of uh, thing you want to do. Do we have time for an extra one? Yeah, we can okay. do one more. Uh, Eric and Lori, if you want to start setting up, please come on up to the front. Any folks, we have another question? I deliver. So uh, first of all, thank you. Great talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm actually dealing with um, with a corner of the software market that is still not quite familiar with open source. Can you understand me? I, I, I can barely hear you, uh, actually. You have to. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. And um, uh, so I, what I see is like a lot of like people don't understand these licenses. People are afraid, and we're now doing an open source project in this area. And I think for some, this. This is actually a bit scary that this is happening now. So, what would you, uh, what is like best practice to convince people that this is that, that I mean, people will have to move, right? People will have to change their their business model to some degree, but to, that this is not a bad change, or that, that people can actually benefit from it. Yeah. So, I, I think the the fastest answer to that is that is the same problem. The, the companies that are in those markets are facing it's a similar problem that the one that they're facing with digital transformation in general, um, and so it should be tackled at the same time. Um, and if it's done properly, it can even help uh, leapfrog a number of companies that have done digital transformation before, but haven't um, actually moved to more of like an open source uh, model for uh, developing software. Does that work as a quick answer? We can talk uh, uh, after yeah, the... I okay. I, I have a shameless plug. Um, I wrote a white... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't... This, I feel I, like I, a I, I could do this. I mean, I, I'm going to do the shameless plug, too, after you're okay, done. Okay, so I wrote a white paper with some collaborators from the FinTech Open Source Foundation called The Business, Business Value Benefits of Open Source for uh, Financial Services Firms, which are traditionally extremely conservative. And all of the arguments in there about why it is important for financial services firms to adopt open source, contribute to open source, operate in an open source way will be equally applicable to, I think, really any industry. Um, so if you have conservative folks at your company, the text is CC BY, copy, paste, remove, add in your industry, reuse, and use it to convince the right people. At L Hawthorne on Twitter, I will tweet it at you. I will email it to you. There's my phone number, send me a signal, a WhatsApp, a DM, or something. I'm Leslie. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Leslie, yes. <laughs> That's Laura. <laughs> All right. And, and so my shameless plug was I actually do that as a living, as a consulting business. And you should give Toby. So you, you can reach out. All right. Thank you, Toby.